these are things I say to myself every day and I don't hoard. All right. And that is don't put it down, put it away. Okay. Right away. Don't put it down, put it away. Because if you put it down, you now have four jobs rather than one. You have to remember it's there. You have to pick it up anyway. You have to remember what you were doing with it and think of where does this go? And then you have to do what you had to do anyway. You have to go put it away. All right. The other thing I I tell people is there is no just for now. All right. That is a big lie. You tell yourself if you've got the luxury of, okay, I know this is containable, then you can try it out. But I'm betting you're going to end up with piles at some point. All right. So when you do that, just say to yourself, look, and I say this to myself 50 times a day, Elaine, just do it now. It's never getting easier. It doesn't get easier. So just do it now. ADHD Rewired episode 295. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Elaine Birchall. Elaine is a registered social worker and a hoarding behavior and intervention specialist. She is the director of Birchall Consulting, which is dedicated to helping those with hoarding behaviors learn to manage their possessions and vulnerabilities. She founded the Canadian National Hoarding Coalition and hosted the weekly Voice America radio show, Take Back Your Life When Things Are Taking Over. i uh, you provide training, consultation, counseling to people and organizations internationally. Uh, she works uh, and has been featured on the media, different media outlets in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, she hosted a six-part series on Canadian regional TV. Um, so you've done a lot of stuff around hoarding. <laughs> Absolutely. And 18 this, years. This is such a great topic uh, for the ADHD community because we know that one, there's a lot of overlap in uh, with ADHD, uh, with executive functioning and hoarding. And um, and a lot of people who aren't maybe uh, meet the criteria of of a hoarding uh, disorder mm-hmm. have, and I would have done put myself in this category as have hoarding tendencies, yeah. right? Vulnerability. The, yeah. The so the, yeah. The, okay. The vulnerabilities. Okay. So yeah, that like, Oh, there's nothing wrong with this things. I'll keep yeah. it just in case. Yeah. I, I noticed that a lot for myself a couple of years ago when I was moving and all those decisions that to make of what to keep and what to get rid of. And man, that's hard. It can be confounding. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said to you before we started the recording, that most of the professionals who come on uh, this podcast also have uh, have ADHD. Um, I just want the listeners to know that we have a uh, a, a neurotypical ally with us today. <laughs> um, Elaine does not have ADHD, but but years and years and years of experience working with with people who struggle with hoarding. And uh, so, I'm really excited to dive in uh, dive into this. So, then, how did you get into uh, uh, specializing in and being having interest in hoarding? Well, I was already a social worker for quite some time, and I just seemed to gravitate toward people who were um, stuck um, and wanted to get out of stuck, that state of, you know, confoundedness um, in difficult life transitions. And so I was successful at uh, getting a job as the one lone social worker at Ottawa Public Health. And they had already started um, kind of a keyword search around 
what is this? Like, this is a new kind of referral. We, they have a, they have an an intense state of excellence, so they don't want to just wing it. Um, that's just their, their standard. And, uh, so they started to do this search and it just became more complicated, um, in their mind didn't fit with anything that they could really say they knew a lot about. So luckily, one of my previous um, deployments as a social worker um, was in developing workshops. So they asked me if I would develop a workshop on this thing that um, was coming to look like clutter, squalor, hoarding, which they didn't understand. And I started to do more research and I thought, I don't know enough about this. Um, If we're going to learn, we're going to learn from somebody who knows what they're talking about. So we found someone who knew what they were talking about um, internationally and we brought them in and um, it took off from there. As I started to listen Um, Over the next few workshops that we did with this person, I realized um, you really needed two things. You needed to be a really good listener and a brain detective. Mm. Um, And you needed to appreciate the uniqueness of each individual because it's not a homogeneous disorder. Just like ADHD is not one thing. No, it is not. No, 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 no. And, And even the complexity of the different individuals that I've worked with over 18 years that have ADD or ADHD, it plays out very uniquely for each person, the combination of challenges and strengths they have. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what you're working with. So I loved it. And I thought, this is me. This is something that I can throw myself into. And it really, every single day makes a difference how well I do my job, which is another challenge I just always seem to rise to. I don't want just the average stuff. I want something that makes a difference. Mm. And there were so few services, but I got to a point where I had to leave Ottawa Public Health because of course they have a mandate, one mandate. And I went into private practice and that's when I found the real joy and meaning in the work I do. So can you help us define and understand what hoarding is? Because I, I think that um, there's probably a lot of, of um, assumptions, and maybe myths around hoarding. Maybe that's a good place to to start. Um, you know, probably a lot of people have seen the show Hoarders. And I, oh. you know, there's probably, you know, yes, that might be hoarding, but there's probably other things that are hoarding that maybe we don't think of as as hoarding. Anything that meets the three criteria. And first and foremost, I want to be sure to mention that because this is a discrete disorder in its own right in the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Health Disorders, Mm -hmm. even though it often, not always, but often coexists with another vulnerability, physical or mental health, Mm -hmm. um, there are three criteria Um, And so, you know, the official diagnosis, the official definition in the DSM-5 is three and a half pages long. So if I boil that down, the three essential criteria always go back to the three criteria. There must be what most people would describe as an excessive accumulation. And I say a failure to discard proportionately. Now, that is not that old adage of one thing in and one thing out. If you can do that that you're probably not on a path to hoarding anytime soon. Um, But you just either never developed, um, it's not your strong suit, um, or it got broken somewhere. That ability to realize when you're approaching the edge of losing control of the ability to manage, that's really important, Eric, because at that point you start to become very overwhelmed. And when that happens, that executive function part of your brain is not your best friend and it's not working for you. It can't help you make the decisions you need to make. And decision making, I imagine, is a huge component of of this oh my goodness yes yes absolutely although there are strategies to help people slow down put themselves on pause go back to working from their strengths nobody's got a full plate of strengths we all have to find our strengths and go back and work from them Mm -hmm. so the second criteria is that some 
or all of the living spaces cannot be used for their intended purpose anymore. Mm. You're still living in the environment, all right? But you may be uh, preparing meals um, on your lap because all flat surfaces are completely choked with stuff. Flat surfaces, by the way, are the first uh, location in your environment that disappears. Mm-hmm. Um, that gets to be a problem because that starts to build chaos. Chaos adds to that sense of being overwhelmed. Um back to the executive functions that are going to try to help you to get out of this that have gone AWOL by this point. The third criteria is that distress or impairment in functioning. And when we're talking about impairment in functioning, we're really talking about risk. All right. And so for anybody who wants to know if they're living at risk, um, the, I don't mean to pitch my book, but um, one of the one of the things we decided to do uniquely that isn't anywhere else that I'm aware of is we actually um, either photographed uh, real locations that represent that risk range from zero, no, no risk at all, to five, this is imminent danger mm-hmm. in all different locations in your environment. One of the things that's really important about that distress or impairment in functioning criteria, though, Eric, is that it doesn't have to be active. If somebody had a reason or the right to know about the true condition of the property, they would have cause to be concerned. You have to tick that box. All right. And that could be your neighbor who doesn't know they're at risk. So they're not prepared to get out anytime soon. Um, Fire department, bylaw, children's services, animal control, um, all met your, your mortgage company, your home insurance company, um, those people would be concerned and that box is ticked. You know, with, with ADHD, one of the, the uh, criteria for diagnosis is that impairment needs to occur in multiple settings. Is that also true for hoarding? Yes. Well, the thi- yes. So it doesn't have, Sometimes there are usually, I would say, high functioning individuals Mm -hmm. that can have a stellar career. All right. And I would bet that they probably have a really good admin assistant uh, to help them. But the hoarding does not play out in that environment. In the book, we talk about professionals, very high functioning professionals. Um, But in their home, their car, their life, their electronics, you know, the records, digital records, um, something as simple as their purse or their briefcase, their car, their backyard, their basement, those areas have become chock-a-block full Mm -hmm. because it is a compulsive disorder. It's not going to stop on its own. I mentioned in the beginning of the conversation that, you know, I, I noticed that I have these hoarding tendencies. I'm wondering in the hoarding sort of community, do mm-hmm. people feel the same kind of uh, um, feeling that in the ADHD community when people say, yeah, we, we, you know, I'm a little I'm a little ADHD when someone really is maybe just a little bit disorganized or a little bit late, but does not actually have ADHD. Someone in the OCD community is like when people say, oh, yeah, I'm a little OCD. It's like it's no, it's not. You know, is there and it just sort of occurred to me is using an expression like or saying like having hoarding tendencies. How, is that insensitive? Is that a does that do a disservice to really understanding what hoarding is? Well, I don't want to say yes, because sometimes that's the first time that people really realize that they they aren't on the fast track to it. All right. But they keep stumbling over the same challenges. Mm-hmm. And when we if we have a minute at some point, I'd like to tell you about the three paths. And one of those paths is pretty much what you're talking about. The thing to keep an eye on, though, um, is that it needs to be repeated. It needs to be consistent. And I would say, too, that 
it needs to extend over a longer period of time. Like you, this is happening for three months, six months, and you're still tripping over the same challenge. All right. And in fact, at that point, it's probably gaining on you a little. And so that would be a perfectly acceptable way to describe what you're experiencing. That is the time to get the help Mm -hmm. because the younger a person starts and the longer that it persists unidentified and untreated or unsupported, the the worse the prognosis for, um, I I want to say a cure, um, but a complete recovery. Okay. Right. Um, and it is does. it is it something that people can recover from, or is it more of like ADHD? It's it's a lifelong condition that needs to be managed. Again, it depends on how how young you were and how long you've been doing it. Um, because it, it, I want you to think of it developing a groove. Okay. All right. And the deeper the groove, the harder to get out of it. Right. Because when you're challenged or you're triggered or whatever set it off, when those types of things happen and you can't control life, stuff's going to happen. Your first reaction is going to be what you've done before. All right. right. So, and, and even, even when it's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. I know mean, because we know it. Right. And so catching it sooner. I, I, I want to say that at an absolute minimum, if you are cognitively intact, all right, you've got full compass mentis, you can learn to manage it like type one diabetes. And many people are able to recover, but they have to kind of keep an eye out because life has a way of ongoing happening and there are negative things that will trigger you and give you the same state of mind and challenges burdens um, that you've had before and so you've got to watch out for those I want to uh, I want to talk a little bit more about those those things to watch out for because I was at a workshop a while back um, where where uh, one of the things the the presenter was talking about is that how often uh, traumas can be uh, sort of the 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 switch that brings it from maybe a tendency to a full on a hoarding disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we dive into that. I want to take a quick break and then we will be right back and and dive into that. And then we're going to talk about uh, these strategies to help us, not just with hoarding, but also just with everyday clutter, because most of our listeners are probably struggling somewhat with everyday clutter. So we will be right back. This episode is brought to you by members of ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups. Let's listen to Blake as he shares his ADHD Rewired coaching group story. I joined the group because I wanted to learn basically from everyone here what parts of my life are ADHD inspired and what parts are a result of two decades of internal criticism. I was diagnosed with ADHD in elementary school. I just thought the principal and I were really tight. And then I was put on meds and I think my parents were less stressed. And by middle school, I decided, oh, I guess that means that I can go off ADHD medication. But mostly it was because I was afraid of how it would look on my college application or when applying to the Air Force. In college, chaos, depression, anxiety all almost led me to failing out of college. And they all seemed like me problems. But after a car accident in January, I started to think that ADHD could play a much more significant role. And I figured the best best way to learn would be to seek out support and be around other people who had a different perspective or a deeper acceptance of ADHD in their lives. And I think that what I came to learn, I did. I've met a community of people who are compassionate and care about me as well as have a lot of life story to share that shows what ADHD can be like, positive, negative. Some people see it as a superpower, some people don't. And I've been able to take away a new kind of acceptance in my life and be able to see a lot of the things that I've struggled with and a lot of the things that have put me on bad terms in my company as things that are just part of me and that can be worked with and that don't reflect my character. I guess the main thing that I learned is that I work best when I work with my ADHD. Thanks again to Blake for sharing your ADHD rewired coaching group story. 
As Blake stated, he joined the group to find out what parts of his life are ADHD inspired and what parts are internal criticism. What are the struggles that you are having in your life? We all have struggles in our life and some come and go and we know how to deal with them. Some struggles are every day. Some struggles leave us exhausted and wondering why is this so hard? Join us for ADHD Rewired's 19th season of coaching and accountability groups. What is your ADHD story? Where did it begin? And how does the story continue? Join us for our next coaching group that starts January 10th. To learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups, visit us at coachingrewired.com. As Blake said, I figured the best way to learn would be to seek out support and be around other people who had a different perspective or a deeper acceptance of ADHD in their lives. Finding that different perspective and acceptance can begin now. Our invitations for our next coaching group has already gone out, but don't worry, check your email and click on the RSVP button at the bottom of that email if you still need an invitation. Remember, coaching groups do fill up fast. Go to coachingrewired.com and click the big purple button. Then just tell me what email I should send it to and your invitation will be on its way. Our winter sessions start January 10th. Our registration kickoff event will be Thursday, November 21st at 11 a.m. Central. Winter sessions start January 10th and go through March 20th. Registration is by invitation only, and you have to attend one of our registration events to join. Coaching groups fill up fast, so sign up today and join other people just like you. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on that big purple button. Then mark your calendar for the registration kickoff event, which is on Thursday, November 21st at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. Group starts January 10th. Go to coachingrewired.com to learn more and to get registered for the November 21st kickoff event. The website again is coachingrewired.com. And we are back. Um, so we're talking to Elaine Birchall, the, the author of Conquer the Clutter, Strategies to Identify, Manage, and Overcome Hoarding. Uh, right before the break, I had uh, asked you about the triggers, triggering events that can sort of um, create the onset of a hoarding disorder. So that probably is best described by um, the three paths that I've identified. The first is genetics. We do know, depending on whose research you listen to, anywhere from 50 to 84 percent of individuals who hoard have a first degree family relative who hoards. That's a mm. mother, father, sister, brother. Mm. When you add to that um, the power of modeling behavior. Um, it's hard to hit a target if you don't know what the target looks like because it's become normalized for you. Um, so um, then if you, if you look at genetics, all right, the genetics of hoarding, we know that there are three chromosomes with markers in common. We know what chromosomes those are. And um, Johns Hopkins did um, an OCD collaborative study um, that found a fourth chromosome, chromosome 14, um, that showed a familial link um, between hoarding and um, OCD in a family. Um, so that just heightens that power of the genetics. The second uh, path is those individuals we're talking about today who have a um, higher risk comorbid factor, which is just a $5 word for other mental health or physical health um, challenge that puts them at a higher risk under the right conditions. Not every, it won't happen to everybody, but we do know the, a pretty good idea of the prevalence rates of that combination, that connection for hoarding disorder to set in. Um, and, you know, ADHD is one of those. Um, what's, what's the rate of, co of, of uh, coexisting disorders with ADHD and, and hoarding? I believe, I believe it's a, in the vicinity of 20, 25%. So the 20, 25% of people who have ADHD will also have 
a hoarding, hoarding disorder. disorder. What's the inverse? So people with, with a uh, hoarding disorder, how, what percentage of those yeah, have ADHD? That I'd have to look up okay. to tell you the truth. Um, I kind of, in my practice, I take it as I find it. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and it's always a, you know, and also how severely you have ADHD, mm-hmm. how severely you have depression, how bipolar addiction, social anxiety, um, a whole host of things. The third path, however, is the one that really, I think, should alarm most people. And that is, you know, you're just not the most organized person or you're going through a protracted period where, you know, it's kind of hard to stay on top of things and they're getting ahead of you. And, you know, where is that one clean shirt? Um, Oh, dear. You know, the dog sat on it. It's (laughs) I mean, all of these stories I hear. And so then something happens either one event, one serious event, um, or a series of smaller events. And sometimes that is trauma. Um, but it could be other things as well. You lose a job, you lose a relationship, you lose some kind of setback. All right. It doesn't have to be just about loss either. It's whatever has the ability to destabilize you. And even if it's a series of smaller events, Eric, where most people, you know, recover uh, relatively quickly, they're happening in a compressed period of time. The person doesn't have that time or the ability to restabilize. So they get knocked out of the game. And I think most of us, um, given the right constellation of events, are vulnerable to that. Mm, so, so this idea, you said the one to be most sort of concerned about is uh, what I hear is the rationalization of, I'm just not the most organized person. Yeah. And I would certainly identify myself as I'm not the most organized person. Um, I, I, my, I am my sort of oasises, I guess, of, of areas where I'm organized. Um, but you know, is I love a clutter free desk. I am very challenged at maintaining a clutter-free desk. I love a clutter-free home. I am very challenged at maintaining a clutter-free home. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and uh, I've been maintaining a clutter-free car for the first time in my life for almost a year now, and it's Ooh, feel woot. it's yes because I used to drive <laughs> a mobile gar- I used to drive a mobile garbage can, um, and now I got a, a you know an adult kind of car, a nicer car than I was you know, and um, yeah, it felt weird at first. I'm like, what's wrong? I keep like washing my car, and like I get it vacuumed like almost once a week, maybe every other week. It's like it feels good. Yeah, it, uh, well, it it just gives you peace, okay? and it gives you that one place where you can be as serene as you need to be, um, which fills the cup, mm-hmm. fills your your life cup, right? Rather than it's taking something from you all the time to stay on top of it, and then you have a challenge and you've got less to give to it because you're half worn out from just staying on top of it. Yeah. So I have to imagine that um, people who are who who organization comes easier to them. It's not just a behavior and a skill. It's a way they think about their stuff and how they interact with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know for me, one of the things that's been helpful for me to to minimize, decrease the, the, the piles and the clutter is to recognize that I never feel like putting the thing away and I can't wait for the the feeling to come to be my cue to put the thing away. (laughs) Right. Because if I don't, I'll be waiting for a long time and those piles will get bigger and bigger. Right. (laughs) And so it's like we hear about a clean up as you go. It's like, okay, that's, which is hard because then that requires working memory. So when you're doing yeah. something, you have to just pause for maybe 30 seconds to a minute to like put that thing Perfect. away and then Perfect. carry on. And one of the things that I catch myself doing, I'll, I'll put something on, you know, counter spaces. So, and then I'll walk away and I'll, be, I'll get it later. And I know when I say anything that has to do with, I'll do it later is a lie I'm telling myself. Yeah. And so I, I, I will stop in my tracks. I'll put the thing away. Not always, but sometimes. Um, but it really, is it's like how to make that process of that be more sort of automatic as like the cleanup isn't this like this thing we do later it's part of the process of any action you're doing yes and so when not to be um, minimizing to those individuals who aren't at this point but you'll get to this point if you just 
work the process. All right. However, if you're coming in for a landing and you're really aiming for um, that kind of, okay, I'm going to stay on top of this as I go. Giving people, I give people a few things to say to themselves. These are things I say to myself every day and I don't hoard. All right. And that is don't put it down, put it away. Okay, right away. Don't put it down. Put it away. Because if you put it down, you now have four jobs rather than one. You have to remember it's there. You have to pick it up anyway. You have to remember what you were doing with it and think of where does this go? And then you have to do what you had to do anyway. You have to go put it away. All right. The other thing I I tell people is catch yourself as soon. I, I loved what you said about the just for now, because there is no just for now. All right. That is a big lie. You tell yourself if you've got the luxury of, OK, I know this is containable, then you can try it out. But I'm betting you're going to end up with piles at some point. All right. So when you do that, just say to yourself, look, and I say this to myself 50 times a day, Elaine, just do it now. It's never getting easier. It doesn't get easier. You know, so in, just in, do it now. You know, what, with, with ADHD and executive functioning challenges, sometimes we look at this idea of just do it as like a, min, a minimizing phrase. Um, and so what I like to do is add a comma and add the word anyways. Just do it <laughs> anyway. Like, yes, it's it's hard. Yeah. We don't want to do it. Nobody wants to right. do it. And Whether you hoard, you don't hoard. You're the most organized person in the world. You don't want to do this. This is like a thankless task. You know, when you had said, uh, um, you know, uh, what was to, to don't put it down, put it away. Mm-hmm. Um, I it's sometimes that you have these moments uh, where it's for me that I sort of catch myself watching myself and realizing the absurdity of what I'm doing right now. And <laughs> and so I have these moments where I am walking from like room to room with an item. I, I know I need to put it away, but I have no idea what to do with it, where it goes. And then so I'll just find another surface to put it out on. well so there's a little trick in the book about this and i can't take credit for it it was my clutter coach heather who um came up with it i think it's genius and that is take a second hold the thing in your hand okay and ask yourself if i was looking for you where would the first place be i'd look and that is its permanent place Mm, i do that with files on my computer (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Just name them properly. Right, right, right. <laughs> name them properly. Yeah. Um, yeah, because then you will always instinctively go to that place. That is your natural place. And the other thing too, while you're getting there, I know this may sound con- counterproductive, but it does work. All right. There are two ways to work in this remediation of the clutter you have. You can um, do the Swiss cheese method. Okay. Which is reach out to any old thing you put your hand on. It's better than nothing. Okay. I definitely take that strategy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the better way to do it only because we get some positive feedback and some reward. The work in life is frankly never done. Right. All right? right. It's never done. That, as soon as we get up, we're making work for ourselves. So pick a spot. It doesn't matter what spot. Pick the spot that's the most annoying to you and start in a corner and work your, your way methodically along the wall. Touch, and whatever you put your hand to, that's what you resolve. You don't go on to anything easier, blah, 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 Any other thoughts, you just put that thing away. And if it turns out that where its permanent home should be, according to your own logic, and you're living in the environment, you get to say where it goes, then, and something else is there, so long as you are not creating a hazard for yourself, all right, Put it as close to where it goes as possible. All right. Because as soon as you start to worry about that domino effect, Mm -hmm. you're you're probably going to get overwhelmed and give up. And the fact is, so long as you are not creating a hazard for yourself, all right, you're going to get to that spot anyway. And by that time, you're going to have remediated a lot of other stuff and opened up storage space and made choices about how many things you really do want to find a home for. Mm. All right. And so it's 
just a natural sequencing that will help you not give up or get overwhelmed with the first three things you pick up. One of the uh, the the uh, strategies that, that um, I've used myself, and I suggest this with uh, with my clients, is um, you know because of our working memory, if we are are need to put something in another room, like it's so easy to just like we go to the other room and then we see something and then now we're dealing with that thing and then we're bouncing yes. all over the house and we were decluttering for two hours and we look around the house we don't know what we've done because it doesn't look like even made a dent. So yeah, I know. One, so one of the things that I've done and it's just to my clients is get it like whether they're garbage bags like paper garbage bags or bins and label each one with what room it is don't leave the room if something goes in another room put it in that bin that's dedicated towards that room and yeah. once you're done with the, the cleaning out that room then you can go bring the stuff to its home yeah that's a, that's a good way as well um the other thing too about as you're as you're working through this um with the individuals i work with who have add or adhd um one of the key things for them is to externalize the message mm -hmm. all right so that it occupies time and space and they have a place to continually check with. So whatever that is, it could be a list on your smartphone that you carry with you. It could be um, a chalkboard that you put down and tick it off as you go. And when you find yourself in that, what I call the muddle moment, <laughs> you know, where you're thinking, oh, yeah, and you've lost kind of track. You're you're in the middle of it, but you're in a bit of a muddle. You can feel that coming on. Mm -hmm. This is what they all tell me. And you can sort of feel it when you're in it. Go back to your list and check where you were. All right. And keep it close by. Keep it close by. Your tools that you need, even if it's your chalkboard or whatever, get a, if you have to get a movable whiteboard, mm -hmm. what, keep it close by a list anything that can be at hand and tick it off as you go. Some people who are particularly challenged with, with sequencing, all right, because they're easily distracted, mm -hmm. um, either visually or mentally, um, writing out the steps. All right. But remember that the step writing out the steps is not supposed to actually be um, the never ending story of the minutia of it. It's the macro Spent three steps. hours planning the That's thing right. that takes what you 10 you minutes do? to do. I made my list <laughs> uh, this week. What did you accomplish? I made my list. Maybe that's too much detail, just macro level. All mm -hmm. right. And you know, macro level by, are you going to see it? All right. Are you going to actually see that that's done? Because that's what you're working for, eh? the reclaiming of your environment for your for your better use. The other thing I ask people to do, because the work that um, is involved in decluttering, whether you're a hoarder or you're not, if you're worrying about it, then this is an issue for you. All right. You don't have to be a hoarder. It's, it's enough that it's an issue um, is to say to yourself, I need goals. And in the book, um, we detail a way. I ask people when, who I work with um, to set three goals. Now, the first goal, all right, is in every single day, not necessarily with your stuff, all right, extract, squeeze out of every single day, joy, fun, and play. Joy is that juice that just elevates you and makes you feel like you're alive and there's a purpose. All right. Fun is that kid in you that is going to keep you alive and curious and, and energized and play play is the thing where, you know, you're doing it for yourself. It just gives you the juice, right? And everybody needs that. The second goal I ask people to set is to remind yourself that you are a growing learning, developing human being, even though you feel stuck and you feel stagnant and you feel a lot of negative stuff, you are essentially a growing, learning, developing human being. What is it you want to know more about? What do you want to do better? What is it you'd like to try? Um, and add a piece of that to every single day, even if it's just, you know, say you want to learn to jump out of airplanes. What are the steps? 
make make a plan that moves you closer, gradually closer to that. That is going to give you so much juice and it keeps you vibrant in your mind so that your body's getting the, the hormones and the chemicals it needs to, to do the work you want. And then the third goal, OK, because life is life involves work is legitimate work. Um, what is it that you need to do um, and make a plan for gradual forward movement with that work every day? The benefit of those three goals is not to overwhelm you. It is to give you permission to parse your day out so that when you've done that 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour of work, you're out of jail. The rest of the day belongs to you. One of the things I encourage my clients to do, too, is always start. This is tough. This is tough. And I admit it. Always start with the thing you least want to do and get it out of the way. Hmm. Give it your first energy. And then the rest of the day is yours without guilt or recrimination or anything. So one, one of the things that I talk to my clients about um, is uh, so, so what you just described is the idea of eating that frog, right? Because if you, if you start your day by eating a frog, everything else you do that day is going to seem easy <laughs> in comparison to having to eat the frog, <laughs> right? It's like you can, you can lick the no frog, you can nail the frog. It's like, yeah, that, just yeah. eat the frog, get it done with. And then, but for yeah. some people that is such a, a, barrier. So what I tell people, like figure out, are you a, a person that needs momentum or are you a person that needs to start with, with a, um, who really will do better by eating the frog. So in an experiment, mm-hmm. so I say, if you are a person that needs the momentum, uh, um, experiment with like, you know, doing something easy, but mm-hmm. then, sure. then observe yourself. Are you say, all right, well, let me just do this one other easy thing. And just, let me just do this one other easy thing. And if that's what's happening, you're mm-hmm. using that as procrastination and avoidance, right? Yeah. But if you could say, all right, I'm going to first do this, this easy thing because I, I need to build momentum. I'm going to first do the easy thing and then I'll do the hard thing. Then yeah. that, then that will work for you. So I always encourage people to, to really be honest, but experiment with what they're trying to do and just notice the outcomes. Like don't be so attached to the outcome. Just notice the outcome. Yeah, be, be an observer yes. of what's actually happening. I call that my rule of three. The first time you did it, it was an accident. <laughs> the second time you did it, it was a coincidence. The third time you did it, it's a pattern. <laughs> Do you want that like pattern? That. Was that the whole point of just developing a pattern that's getting you nowhere? Come on. <laughs> right. It's like, how, how's that working for you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Face the truth and face it sooner than later. And it's a smaller problem. All right. Decision making. Okay. So um, I developed um, a scaling process because one of the things that I learned, well, I guess it was fundamental to my belief system as well, but it was reinforced for me that you need to respect your own. You have relationships to our things. Everybody does. All right. And um, the deeper the attachment, the more complicated um, saving patterns, for instance, um, Are you a sentimental saver? Do you give every single thing that you see intrinsic value, maybe exponential intrinsic value? Or are you aesthetically drawn and connected to this thing? Um, So that it is, you know, that which is, by the way, one of the dangerous parts about trying to apply the condo method. If you have any hoarding vulnerabilities, you have any experience with repeated clutter that just What sparks joy? Problem is with many, many people, every single thing sparks joy. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, you got to watch that. It's it's probably a great method. (laughs) I always find I've seen a a couple of the episodes of of her show on Netflix, and I'm just like, you know, there's things that bring me joy. I don't think decluttering will ever be one of them. Yeah. Right. It's just like I I like I I like a nice you know decluttered space. And, you know, it's, I don't know how to, how do I summons that feeling of how can I make this process that I really don't enjoy because it's difficult for me, joyful? Like, I, I don't know. And how many people can rip their house apart and start from scratch and do the whole job oh in one fell swoop? Uh, and it's not to criticize. It's just that those are people that I don't meet very often. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, and I'm not related to any of them either. 
<laughs> the truth. So, and I used to do this a lot more before I really understood my ADHD, where I would get, all right, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like clean out my my desk drawers, and so I empty everything out, and about halfway through, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Right. It's <laughs> I'm like tired well, bored. Right. And so it's like I I've I've become much better at like making sure the scope of my decluttering project is really small so I could stop at any point and just, you know, pick it up later. That's another really great point. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so I phrase that a little different, but it's amazing how sort of on point we are uh, with what we say and what we do. I say Ga- take take your own temperature, gauge how much juice you have in the tank. Okay. How much fuel you have and don't be promising the 15 minutes you have in the tank to a two hour job. That's a recipe for disaster. Find a 15 minute job. Okay. Better yet, find a 13 minute job and then sit down and have a coffee and reward yourself. And then also look at your history of how often do you think something is 15 minutes know, and it actually takes you two amazing. hours. Yeah. We work a lot so, in my groups about like really oh, grasping yeah. the difference between how long we think things take and how long they actually take. Yeah. Which is a great thing for a great point for externalizing, mm-hmm. because when you mark it off, you could also put how long it took you to do it and then go back and just, OK, that's what it looks like. But yes. in reality, it's not. So back to the scaling system, because I'd like to kind of give you this before I go. It works for many, many people. You need before you start to decide which of the three categories your belongings uh, belong in, you need to come up with honestly and truly from your own um, values and your own relationship. What are the criteria that constitutes something that makes it be a one, two, three, a four, five, six, or a seven, eight, nine, ten? All right. And the one, two, threes are your first priority. They are the things that matter the most. Nobody gets to say what they should be other than you. It's based and and you're saying things to yourself like, just love it. I don't care. I don't care if you like it. I don't care. I don't care. Anybody else says it's almost a protectiveness. I love it. It, it. And you know what? I can't imagine life without it. All right. That's how meaningful it is to me. Set those aside. Okay, we're going to do our level best, 100%. I've never found a situation where we couldn't make those fit in your environment. So then we go to the other extreme because they're easier, the 7, 8, 9, 10s. Okay, 7, 8, 9, 10s are the easy wins. They're the things that when you look at them, you say, what's that thing still doing here? I thought it gave that out. Or you're saying something like, if something has to go, okay, it's going to be you because it sure isn't going to be any of the one, two, threes. Four, five, sixes is where we dance. And so just like a Geiger counter, take the thing that is the biggest one, two, three, take the thing that is the most reasonable representation of the seven, eight, nine, ten, and run them over the remaining items and figure out, are they closer to the one, two, threes? Mm -hmm. It's a kinesthetic experience. You have a relationship with these things. Stop going to your head. Okay, because we live in our hearts. We run things by our head to make sense and to justify them. But you've held on to these things for a reason. All right. And then try the love and the best you can try to kind of settle on finding a home for the fours. And you you it makes sense to keep and try to house as many as the fives. All right. As you have room for, but time and space is finite and it's not the last thing you're going to fall in love with. You want room for the future, right? Just because you hoard or you have clutter doesn't mean you're not going to be interested in something tomorrow or the next day. Where is it going to be in the new pile? Make room for the future. Don't drag the past behind you. You can't move forward dragging the past behind you. I have to imagine that so, so much of uh, um, the challenge that people experience who are, uh, who are hoarders um, is shame. And people with ADHD, we, we work, we deal with this big time as well. And which is why, you know, the, the work that I do with, with clients is all, it's all group based because I think in, in group is where, um, powerful. We, yeah, we, we share the struggle and we realize, oh, we're not the only one that, that does this and thinks this way and shame can't survive when, when we speak it. 
do you are there support groups for for hoarding um that, that you're aware I've of i've run two support groups and one of the things once i get the publicity for the book my obligations around the publicity not obligations but the work around mm-hmm. the publicity and promoting the book out of the way um and i have a little more time i think i'm going i'm going to do an online group Mm. so that people can join in um, because you don't, there are enough people for multiple groups all the time. And there are two ways that I've done it. One is just with individuals who hoard. um, And one is with individuals who hoard, who bring a buddy and it's their clutter buddy. But the clutter buddy doesn't contract to lift a darn thing or do any of the physical work. What they contract to do is exactly what you said and good for you for recognizing it. That is to break down the shame. So whatever the clutter buddy's personal opinions on clutter is, they promise and we monitor it to park that. Okay. And they promise to be the person that they the individuals who hoard can go to when something great happens, when they have a success and share it with them and they celebrate it with them or when they're having the worst day of their life and they share that and the advice and the feedback they give is based on the information, sound information that is provided in the group. So it's a way of making those messages and re resetting the dialogue all right um protracted over like eight ten weeks um and i think i'd have to say that the group with the clutter buddy um has worked more effectively that's for surprise. people yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that's very similar to the, the groups that i do um is there anything else that uh, you think that, that listeners should be uh, aware of or any resources that you want to share? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, if you go to um, hoarding.ca, that's my website. I have a tab there. Um, there are free videos that you can watch about if you're, if you're listening because you love somebody or you care about somebody and you don't share the disorder, how to approach and keep that dialogue uh, in, you know, in a healthy way. Um, and there's just a whole host of resources that are free there. Um, what else? Um, if all else fails, try to get a copy of the book. A Kindle version, I think, in the States is $15. So, um, and it was designed, the, the way that we designed this book is to be different. Um, and it's to fill the gap um, when you can't afford services or you're not sure um, or those services aren't available. It's not an academic book. It's based on, on best practice. It's based on the science of hoarding, but it's not a theoretical book. It's not a research book. And we did that deliberately. Those books have been written and well-written. There was a gap for in the trenches. Now, what do I do? Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for coming on the show and for the work that you're doing. I know that you're helping lots and lots of people uh, conquer the clutter strategies to identify, manage and overcome hoarding is her book. Elaine Bergeau, thank you so much for coming on. We will link uh, on the, the show notes of this episode, uh, all the links and resources that you just shared. Just go to ADHDrewired.com slash whatever episode number this happens to be. That's the URL that will we'll, we'll get you there. So, uh, Elaine, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I should say, too, I'm a co-author. Suzanne Cronkright is my co-author. She's a, a technical writer. I'm sorry. I got so excited talking to you. I forgot to mention it. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Much and, uh, and you can reach out to uh, to Elaine and, and find her book, um, you know, at her website and her books wherever you find books, Amazon and all those kind of those kind of places. So thank you, library maybe. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation, Eric. It was great. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. 
You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.